Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Inji Yusuf, and today I want to take you with me on an end-to-end -end journey to secure your applications. Well, yes, uh, InfoSec touches many aspects and topics, but AppStack, in my opinion, is this area which deserves really a round of applause. It's like dotting the eye of security, indeed as everything really starts with software and how secure it is. So let's see how we are gonna adopt the eye of security and shift flat for secure by default. So, so um, I am NG Youssef and I'm a Bakai. I got my PhD from OSU in cryptography and network security. And I'm a defender and I'm currently the head of integration security at JPMC. So I love APIs, I love Kafka, I love Red Air, but MQ, uh, you get the idea. I like to think of my role as an enabler, uh, and I believe in all the great work that technologies are doing. Um, I want to make sure that no one can ever stop that. So how does your SDLC looks like? Um, are you adopting a waterfall model, or maybe you are in an agile shop? Uh, or I wonder if you're uh, DevOps enthusiast and you're really automating all the things. Uh, whatever your SDLC looks like, I believe that we all agree that software bugs is a dilemma. And we know that the long, uh, uh, that, that actually the longer it takes for us to discover it, you know, you, it, the cost goes up, up higher. So you see as in this diagram here on the left, how is you, uh, uh, the, the, the Bugs discovered in prod are the ones of the highest cost. It's such a steep cost. And uh, we've been doing all what we can to really try to discover these things early. That's just how we've been uh, trying to address software bugs. Uh, think things like pair programming, test-driven development, and all the other great stuff that you see on this diagram here on the right. So, you know what, um, surprise, surprise, security bugs are no different. And the earlier security issues are discovered, actually, the better. So that's why it's really important to shift left. And uh, by shifting left, we are talking about, um, you know, really wanting to shift, to start early with the with security, as early as maybe your requirements phase, um, as early as possible. And prevent uh, that will help will help prevent really that you just you open up Pandora's box in deployment. No one wants that, right? So when we're saying this word shift left, uh, what we mean is that the software development lifecycle goes uh, usually from left to right here, as you can see, all the way to deployment. And so we're saying shift left. It really means starting early in the earlier uh, stages of the software development lifecycle. So how far can we go then? Uh, and how about just uh, you know, starting as early as the business hands over the requirements to IT? Um, what about that? Let's see. Uh-oh, I hate to break the news to you, but this one can be challenging. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. There's this notoriously known damaging problematic scone, cone of uncertainty. So the cone of uncertainty, as you can see here, is basically saying, well, at the beginning of any of our, uh, our projects, there is always the challenge of trying to, uh, uh, to understand the requirements. There's this uncertainty that is there. And uh, really what we're trying to do is to try to engage in those uh, uncertain areas. It's hard. And, and there's lots of functionalities of software that's not even clear at that stage. Okay, so let's dive in. Uh, we'll take the challenge, challenge examples. Let's take it step by step and let's see how we can start as early as possible in the requirement stage while keeping the uncertainty in check. So let's start with the requirements. <laughs> Um, if you're an Agile shop and you're probably very familiar with Agile stories, of course, you know, it's your requirements. Um, these are your requirements uh, and, and they are mostly like epics at the beginning. And then they are further draw, like broken down and, and analyzed, uh, clarified as, the, as your uh, work uh, progresses. Uh, these stories form the backlog of the teams and uh, 
that's all good till now. Well, oh yeah, except that security requirements are often, often misunderstood as the dreaded optional. Uh, they are mixed up with uh, because uh, the, the problem is that it's it's often often this misunderstood uh, uh, very badly misunderstood non-functional requirements. So non-functional requirements are never optional. They are actually mandates. They are constraints to make the system work correctly. But you know, you know what? Life happens, right? And usually we end up in situations where developers are looking at what they need to achieve, and well, non-functionals are not one of them. You want to deliver features, right? So, well, that's not so cool for us because, uh, well, that makes us, of course, miss on, uh, makes our lines miss a lot on the security requirements. So we need to find a way to put our security stuff in the stories ecosystem. We don't want to be, you know, uh, existing in an alternate universe or something. So security stories come to the scene, as you know, and, um, and in AppSec, there is two models. So the, 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 the AppSec, uh, uh, folks try to solve this problem and say, okay, I'm going to step in with my securities or stories. And two models introduced. The first one uses what's called evil stories, which talks about a malicious user and then says, as a malicious, uh, you know, uh, uh, external user, I want to. And then it talks about what is the exploit they want to do and uh, what is the objective, what's going to happen, what's the damage that's going to happen. That's one form of capturing what uh, the, the security threats, okay? These are called the negative stories or evil, whatever you want to call it. The other type, which is the standard, more direct approach, is to say, here are security requirements. I'm going to define it by the role. So we say something like, as a security, as an architect, I need to do this. As a developer, I need to do this. And then you start talking about the things, uh, the, the assurances that uh, this role should do. So, for example, implement an input validation or do whatever. Um, so an example where you can find lots of these uh, great stories are uh, in safe code uh, security stories uh, uh, bank. And it's, it's really great. But, uh, well, there are a number of challenges here that I think are not given its fair share. And uh, the problem here really is, uh, is that at the beginning, again, with the uncertainty around what needs to be in this backlog and all these stories flooding the backlogs of teams, no one is happy. And, well, think about it also. The stories are supposed to be provided by the requirements analysts, and we start piling these expectations on them uh, to provide us also with these security stories. And again, the one's winning. So something is not sinking in about those security story stuff. So can we do it differently is the question. And my answer here is yes, please, let's play. Gamification and security requirements can be just like peanut butter and jelly. Friends, let's see how. It's all about serious gaming. So there's this concept of serious gaming, and that's basically a game that's played to achieve a certain objective and teach something or complete maybe a task. And um, the example we'll use today is a game. It's a deck of cards. Uh, it's called the Elevation of Privilege uh, game. It's a Microsoft game, and it's actually used for threat modeling. And threat modeling is one of those AppSec activities that happens in the uh, design stage when we are still in the requirements. See, that's the trick I'm going to play here. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you know what? Uh, I'm, what I'm doing, trying to do here on you, I'm shifting gaming left because the original game itself is usually done on a design, like there's a diagram and it's a little bit more, uh, it needs this diagram and serious design, right? Uh, but here I'm gonna play differently. I'm gonna play it on the requirements, okay? So, um, it, so it, I'm telling you really that, uh, you know, shifting gaming left is, is, is really great. Uh, the, there's no better time because that is when the team is still fresh, receiving the requirements and everyone is trying to understand what is needed and willing to give it time. 
Now, as you start to engage gaming in the more uh, faster stages, it's not well received. So I guess that the idea here is to shift gaming left and see what will happen. So, uh, so let's play. Um, the way this works is that we'll need those stories mapped in the backlog. So first, I need the team to have those uh, this backlog of stories in it so that we can start working. Like I can't start working, say, on just a couple of requirements written uh, out vaguely. It needs to be like broken down into uh, uh, more clearer compositions. Not the design, but just the stories itself. So that's the stage where we can play this. Uh, and then uh, the team meets together. So that includes the security requirements analysts, the teams, and then they start to play. And here is how. So as we said, this is what we're working on. We put the goals, activities, tasks, and then we start dealing the cards. So now here, tune in. We have our card deck with us, which is the Elevation of Privilege game, and we start to play. And so, for example, Lila, one of the uh, participants in the game, says, oh, I now have the card that is 10 spoofing. So uh, it, it says an attacker can choose uh, weaker or no authentication. I think that is an attack can, that, can, that needs to be in consideration as we're designing the sign up and login feature to make sure that the login cannot be bypassed or that we're using strong authentication. So that's one. Peter now plays six, denial of service. And they say, hmm, okay. So I have cards says denial of service that the attacker can make a server unavailable. Okay, let me try the search product. Um, if, it's, if they bypass the login and try to use it directly, maybe try to abuse the feature. So that's a threat scenario. Mark it down. And then Mary plays six of tampering and says, well, an attacker can write to a data store, which you, which, you, which you are relying on. And she thinks, oh, okay, in the search product, what can happen is that maybe instead of searching, they're trying actually to modify my store. Yes, got it. Noted. And the fun continues. So the best is yet to come down because you know what? Uh, team say here, we're not really trying to create our own thing. We're not going to create security stories. Yes, no security stories. I just said that. No security stories. I'm going to use just the old plain stories. I'm not going to add my our own called security stories. It's just teams that security should not be its own. It should be their own, should be owned by the team, part of their work, part of their tool set, part of everything they do. It's embedded, not just a thing beside the things. So we'll add the detected attacks here as acceptance criteria. Uh, and we don't need to think about any solutions. Keep it high level, keep it simple, and so that it, it is lightweight and it's nice and we can progress. Really, the outcome is beautiful and very empowering. So here's an example. So for example, you can have the same story, right? I didn't change anything. I even kept the color for you, the yellow. So as an authenticated customer, I want to search products by size color so that I find a good fit. The acceptance criteria here is many, many things. Among them, if the attacker must not be able to use the search to change any of the product details using maybe any of the injections attacks or any of this. That's, if that's, you know, if, if the team can just put that in, that's amazing. You don't have to look for solutions. It's not the time. We're not solutioning. We're just trying to say, say what needs to be done, okay? Now, uh, that you might think, oh, NG, is that really useful? I'll tell you, yes. Because at that stage, you're defining what needs to be done, helping the SMEs, the technical SMEs, as the requirements pour into the line in the architects, in the devs, where they are familiar with, with how to implement this. That is when we can start to add solutions. And that's what I'm going to do next. So now we're moving to the design. So the attacks uh, guides the security architecture in design choices, enables early considerations of what can go wrong. And now we're prepped with 
concept for the next stage of design where the architecture takes this in mind. And then we can, after the design emerges up, we start for a formal threat modeling session. So, yes, indeed, let's do threat modeling. And you know what? I'm just going to tell you, threat modeling is given a design diagram, defining what we are going to build. We're just going to try to think for, of all the ways things can go wrong using an approach uh, methodology called STRIDE. And then we're going to try to do something about it. So we're going to identify those attacks. Beta attack three tries to either try to identify or what are we going to do with the risk? Are we going to fix it, hit it, accept it, transfer it? It's our decision. We have to note it and document it and handle it. So uh, just a note on, and, and I know that I, this is just a very high level on what threat modeling is. And again, it's a very detailed, technically uh, involved with many dimensions and stuff. It's not hard. It's just that it is a process that stands and it deserves its own. And that's why it's left to in the design where all these things are obvious and clear. So STRIDE is a short for spoofing, uh, identity tampering, data repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, escalation of privilege. So all these things are really categories that simplify attack types and guide the thought process as we're performing the threat analysis on the diagram that's provided to us as what we are building and, uh, and help, uh, help us identify those threats in order to address. So gamification can definitely help here uh, also if needed. So you know what, I, have, I am more inclined to actually keep again gamification left more in the, requ in the requirements at that early, just because by the time it reaches the architecture, there is more inclination to get things more formal, more documented, release it fast, things like that. And the appetite for the gamification might start going down. But if you really need it, if you can't think about the threats and you need those small nudges around it, then that will absolutely uh, uh, help which is using gamification. Surprise, surprise, you can even use the same deck that we refer to, which is Elevation of Privilege Game. In order to do that, it is actually intended for that stage to start with. It's just that I do believe that it has a better opportunity in the requirements phase than the threat modeling, but again, both uh, can be used based on the appetite of the application team and their choices. So, um, it, so really what happens next? Coding, starting, buckle up, let's get started because things are gonna move really fast starting from now. So here are some, I wanted to share some just important things that uh, different uh, that, that we need as a team, as a dev team to really look at. Uh, once the, 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 we are starting to work on our code and this process starts and it rates, based on your SDLC uh, style. But as a developer, what do I need to care about? Um, first of all, we, we promise as developers that we're gonna take secure code training. You need to know what WASP is. If you don't know what WASP is, please run, go ahead and go to wasp.org, check out the top 10 at least, and uh, go through the, that how to mitigate those risks and how to be able to code defensively. So meaning of coding defensively, how we can treat all user input as untrusted, that's security headers, da 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 da, lots of stuff. Um, that's first, knowledge is power. Second, use libraries and frameworks. So think Spring security, use the whatever coding frameworks they're using, they have security constructs that you can use. Do not develop your own specific crypto stuff, please don't. And there is also, WASP also has also great libraries that you can use. I would rather you use uh, uh, one of those, uh, you know, uh, uh, WASP Java encoder or any of the, you know, the things there where uh, this can, can really help you even, you know, uh, SAPI as well, the framework. Um, but use those rather than develop your own. Again, there's multiple com complicated things that can go wrong. I would rather you use it and it's gonna save you time, by the way, so that's a win-win. Include security in uh, 
your agile testing suite. You know what I mean by that? Uh, when you're talking about your unit tests, include me in, please. I want my negative unit tests. Uh, secure integration tests, include me in, please. Your API tests and all these things. Security, please include me. Security acceptance tests, please write tests for that as well. That is security oriented. So include in your agile testing pyramid. Use secure testing tools as early as your IDE, shift, left, start in your code. Because you know what? When you are developing in your development environment and you're able just to, you have a plugin uh, uh, in your IDE that can detect things as early as you're writing it, much better than to wait until you're trying to merge your code into the team repo and ah, you get stopped. You don't want that. Start, uh, consider static as well as dynamic testing. Static is just like your uh, static code scans, like, you know, sonar stuff, but then with rules specific for security. And there are specialized codes like find sick bugs and others are great. Um, these are open source stuff, so you don't have to pay even for it. Um, another thing is, please tell me, promise me, you'll never keep secrets in your code or code repos. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Use security tools to detect and prevent any mistakes. And always be careful to track your dependencies. When we're writing code, we know we're relying on open source frameworks. We're knowing we're relying on third-party components, right? And uh, I think it's very clear now that those third-party components can be an eminent third source of threat. And it's important to be to have what we call BOM, which is a bill of material of what are the components uh, that are in my code that I'm using and tracking those, be able to track their licenses. It's another thing. Here's another uh, important thing, which is to comply legally of how we're using the open source software in our code, but then also to check for vulnerabilities. Super important. So vulnerable dependencies are one of the most uh, uh, critical flaws in software. You need to be aware of it. Now as a development team, Let's talk over stuff for you as a team. Uh, first of all, again, our team members need to have their secure coding coding training that just has to be a motto inside our team. Uh, we need to have a checklist for security. And that's where I'm going to bring in the, the, the organizational responsibility there. But, you know, being able to identify here is what are the non-negotiable security things that we will not accept in our code. And then we do security code reviews before merging any of these new codes. We don't allow bad code to progress ever. Implement a proper separation of duties across from their pass and pride. And you know what? This is absolutely important, not only by audit, but also for security purpose. Because you know what? We should never, ever, ever, ever have fraud data in tests. Guys, really focus on solidifying your test data management practices. What are you going to use for testing? What is the test data? Where do you source it from? All this stuff. Never use fraud data. Uh, and there are ways, of course, like you can, you know, have there's those tooling and stuff that provide support for how you can uh, create those data sets. It's important to really tackle those seriously. Uh, another thing is around uh, making sure that we as a team make it easy for our team members to comply and to be able to run their tests. So that means if we have a code pipeline, if we're a DevOps shop, we have a code pipeline, continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline, Please integrate your security checks there so that the teams, uh, uh, if they forgot to use their tooling or anything like that, that is the, 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 the second uh, uh, line of defense here uh, on making sure the security checks are run. Uh, and always compare against a certain security baseline, monitor for drift, and try to keep this in check based on a certain bug bar that you define for your team. And all these things are going to help you absolutely with audit. It's just that also it helps, again, drive the secure culture within your team. Ensure visibility of work. I can't stress this much, uh, 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 strongly enough. Um, as long as we don't consider security remediations, work that is being completed, effort that's been put in hours of hard real work and be able to bubble this up, uh, uh, appreciate this effort, it will always be just a second thing to do. 
um, ensure that this is prioritized, applauded, uh, celebrated, that, that in a way that just gives this, uh, makes this a part of the culture. Uh, keep a tap on software currency, please. So here's one thing that I, I really want to share, which is, guys, as we're developing software, it's just we we don't upkeep our technologies, just migrate to this latest version of Java, or we are stuck in this, you know, stuck framework. There is, you know, uh, uh, like little we can do uh, to treat the vulnerable dependencies because there is existing software. It's not everything that we're creating, you know, and the new will become old. So just keeping up your software currency will automatically help soft security. So that's uh, a great thing. Automate, automate, automate. Please do. Uh, it will help a lot. Uh, reduce all the friction for security in your team. And you know what? Security also needs to speed up across the enterprise, across the organization. And uh, in that section, I want to focus a little bit more, having a small talk with our security teams. So on the flip side, let's start to see how we can make it easier, speed things up, because otherwise we're not going to be able to uh, help the teams. You know why? Because for teams, they are uh, required and they are asked continuously by their businesses, by their departments, to deliver at speed because things are needed fast, as fast as possible. There's competitive advantage there. There's things that needs to be done or other some stuff will explode, all these stuff. The pressures on the team is really to deliver and we just need to try to continue to help them do that. And you know what? DevOps is great. But unfortunately, just as you can see in this picture here on the bottom, lots of times we look at security as uh, not necessarily, it, from a secure perspective, that DevOps is causing us trouble because speed means mistakes and mistakes means issues. And that shouldn't be that way. Um, so really the idea here is that if, you, if your teams are moving fast, move fast with them, integrate your tools in their CI, CDF, you know, like again, you have your code reviews, your static analysis, your your uh, your uh, different DAS tooling and software composition analysis, and all the stuff. These can be integrated with their pipelines as part of their testing, as part of their observability practices in production, also, and all all these things. We just need to work together uh, to make it happen. Well, a good question also is, uh, hey guys, we're talking about speed and how we can help the DevOps team that want to move fast. But what about non-DevOps teams? Are we gonna say, oh, okay, they can settle, that we need to leave them to move secure slow. That's fine, it's, they are slow teams. Uh, they, you know, they are non-DevOps team, I'm not gonna say slow. Everything is supposed you know, to be uh, uh, delivering fast, whatever works for your team. DevOps is not solution for everything, right? But all what I want to say is that uh, even if they are not DevOps teams, even if they are not using code pipelines, you still need to make security a fast to do thing. So the idea here is uh, security need to DevOps. When we're saying that, we're really saying that we need to streamline application security through automation, feedback loops, and different cultural aspects of DevOps. So see, DevOps is really, when we talk about this word dev and ops, it's talking about how we can bring both development and operations together. And then we added the sex of security. Uh, so it's a cultural component. So how we can reduce those handoffs, work together as a team, police killing, all this fun stuff. But then also practices, practices around uh, here is uh, we're going to do, you know, uh, uh, different uh, important practices, um, uh, development practices, the, things like that, uh, that will help us, uh, uh, you know, observability as a practice and DevOps, auto, you know, all these all these kinds of things, test-driven development, all these stuff. And then also processes, so processes of building this code pipeline and then, uh, you know, uh, trying to automate all the things. And then tooling, which is lots of tooling that DevOps have for configuration management and many other stuff. So can we DevOps as security? That's the question. 
And my answer is absolutely yes. Uh, so I have here for you, this is the framework. Uh, I always uh, pivot back to that because the way I, I, I try to look at security and AppSec whenever uh, for any of, our, of the organizations is that we, it starts uh, with, with trying to look for these four things, the tooling, the practices, processes, and the culture. So first of all, look at the, at the bottom of this, this, this framework here is tooling. Stay with the dev tool set. Uh, choose security tooling that are, uh, can, that are API enabled, that are, have already lots of integrations that also lean into open source and native tooling where, which are things that can be easily consumed by devs but less is more, so don't just also flood them. It's not going to work. No one is going to win. <laughs> the second thing is work on practices. If I come to you and say, you have to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, hundred, 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 and you're going to be like, okay, uh, can I? Can you give me what is the five top things I need to do, please? So it's a, it's a fair question, and it deserves a fair answer. And so prioritized practices is very, very important. So for example, in, in, in a previous organization I was in, we said, okay, we're gonna focus on, here's a SaaS, here's, here's uh, uh, the use of um, uh, secure scanners. Uh, we're trying to, um, uh, to focus on having also checking vulnerable dependencies and secret scanning and having a dynamic scan. So these are the practices we want to make sure that every line has, and then we're gonna try to make this super easy. And then if we finish this, this is phase one, the phase two of practices is start talking about the agile uh, test, uh, testing. And then we say, if you finish this, the next phase is, and we start talking about more like the threat modeling and, and stuff like that. So it's all really about this prioritization. Now, as we go and talk about the processes, the most important is to embed everything as part of the software development lifecycle. And what that really means is uh, we're trying to look at how can we shift left, start early, uh, do test-driven security, which is through embedded stuff in the different uh, uh, enterprise uh, repositories, and environments, but also in the pipelines. Another thing is how to standardize through architecture patterns with security built in, not as an, as an add-on. So how can we provide those patterns with already security considerations inside them, reusable patterns that can be used by teams? And then automated governance and tracking. What's the concept of continuous security? How can we provide those uh, uh, bug reporting and things directly to the teams, how can we monitor the drift? Now, think about it, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, again, in relation to the DevOps practices and the continuous monitoring idea. Now, as we go on more to the culture and we're talking about communities of practices and hack days, gamification, building this transparency, this sharing, this hands in, hands in hand, um, Visibility of work, appreciation, no, no blaming, all, all this is very, very important in developing the security and DevOps style uh, for, the, for your organization. And we're talking about layered enterprise uh, controls. So uh, that means we're going to try to do a defense in depth. So don't depend on only the developers uh, doing their share. Don't depend on only an application development team doing their share. Make sure that as an enterprise, you own as a security team, and uh, you own this responsibility to make it easier for all these players. Meet teams where they are, regardless of whether or not they are a uh, uh, the, the most modern uh, uh, DevOps team or or not. We just need to be with them with security whenever we they need uh, in all the times because it's needed all the times. Not the eye of security. <laughs> AppSec. So AppSec plan rollout. Uh, so that's just the simple here. So for example, we're talking about uh, these stages. So uh, usually it's very hard for the teams to start just by talking about threat modeling and secure stories. Like it's, it, it, it sometimes is hard, although it is the first thing of shifting left, right? 
but it sometimes is hard and it's sometimes easier to use just tooling for detection as early as possible in uh, their life cycle, which is once the coding starts. So as you're planning your rollout, you don't have to start where you think is the optimal. It has to be driven by how your culture of the organization is, their degree of readiness, and their maturity in the AppSec journey. So don't the, usually also the use of the tools helps educate and, and teach and bring bring along uh, for uh, your, your AppSec journey. Uh, so tooling like, you know, SaaS, software composition analysis, secret scanning, DAS. And then you have those layered enterprise controls, uh, which we talked about. Don't only depend on the developers. They're super important. But also don't only depend on the uh, teams and their build servers and their central integrations. Provide this enterprise level assurances through this pattern catalogs, through this virtual pipeline of security integrations and the code repositories, so and, and things like that. So let me show you. That's an example of an enterprise uh, virtual pipeline, you could say, as code flows. So for example, here, this is the software development lifecycle processes, teams push code through code repository. Once it hits the code repositories, you can have integrated scans there from a SAS, for scanning, software composition analysis, all these stuff. But then also now they build, there's build artifacts, right? Now he's going to a build artifactory and again, you meet them there with, their, with the necessary skins and reporting and automated reporting, seamless and easy. And then you go on QA and staging and, and, and you see my point. So the idea is that there is this enterprise pipeline where you embed the skins. You don't go across each team and ask them, did you scan, did you scan, did you scan? Although this is this is traceable too, you need to trace that, but to track it. But that is another level of assurance, which is why we're doing this defense in that and provides it for the teams who are not ready yet. You don't have the ability to run these uh, uh, assurance functions as a team. And that is an example of like what would the team do, say in the CI, in the CD. Um, you know, the use of the build checks, the unit test, the testing suite, uh, security smoke tests, specifically in the beginning in CI. You don't want to like make people like failing builds all the time, which really frustrates them. So being able to run just a specific set of tasks, which we call smoke tests, just a sanity check. And then after that, as you go and develop deployment, is when you start to put the real serious, more deep dives, task going, which scans for longer times. And it, 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 it it is needed at that time as a gate before deployment. And then you have developers where the magic really happens, right? So it, it enable them, enable them with the tools they need. If you don't have enterprise tools, if you don't have the budget, go for open source. There's lots of beautiful stuff. And enable them to have it, have self-serve friction. That's again, the concept of DevOps that applies, how we can self-serve, uh, how we can have no wait periods, all these important concepts. And I have some lists of don't forgets for you. Metrics, 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 and OKRs. So the idea why I keep repeating it that way is that usually your AppSec program is one of the uh, it, the most challenging to, to draw the uh, further investments for. And the reason is that, you, you know, it's that area where you don't get to know that it's important until real disasters and breaches happen. And then people start putting money in there. But until then, you need to drive your program as a security team by showing and demonstrating the value you're bringing. So target uh, measurements that looks at uh, the average time to resolve uh, for security flaw. Look at things like the fault creation rate and the fault fixing rate. Like, what is the, are the teams getting better? Because as I mentioned, there is a trick when we're saying security tools it's not only for testing. I'm telling you, it is an educational tool to start with. It brings the security awareness and drives it home. If you give them 100 million training classes and, and, and that's that they might forget it next day or they might be just you know sitting and not really watching the training correctly or attending the class and not really focusing. But then did the IDE plugin for a SaaS tool will keep, will, is this, online tutor with them, helping them all the time understand what can be done and how this can be fixed. 
So, uh, so that's that's how this fault creation rate it's less, and the fault fixing rate goes up. And then uh, you want uh, also to measure those DevSecOps controls. Like, for example, are you seeing activities on the on the developer side? Are you seeing activities on the in the team side? How about the enterprise controls? How are the maturity in all of this? How are we progressing? And hack the culture. I keep I I believe that. It all starts with the culture. Um, so bring people together, community of practice for your AppSec and DevSecOps practices, share exciting things, hit stickers, uh, uh, you know, and, and make people enthusiastic about it. Uh, focus on role-based training and AppSec 101. So people might not be happy with you if you give them a 12 hours training each year for things that you keep hearing about for AppSec. But they might be okay with a one-on-one course that just, you know, a, a, a one-hour course or something or a three-hour course and that's it or two hours course and that's it <clears throat> or even less. But they take it and they're happy to, to, to take this reminder uh, for AppSec. Uh, hack days and remediation campaigns. The idea is here, here is that probably you're starting, if you're starting your AppSec program, you have a few huge laundry list of bugs that needs remediated. The way to do this is really, sometimes it's hard to get this time out of the teams. And so do those remediation campaigns and say, hey, we're gonna focus on SQL injection. We're gonna be free of SQL injections in three months or so on. And then hack days. So bring teams together and say, we're gonna sit together today and we're gonna focus on vulnerability X, Y, and Z. Here's how we solve it. Let's repeat it across all the code bases that are in this game. Um, <clears throat> model lines to show what it looks like through a team who adopted it. Security champions. Uh, people uh, are attracted to uh, new cool things, right? And so you will find great developers who really bought into your concept. You know, they believe in what, what security is about. They want this, this to work. And they can be your champions on the line advocating for security. Create maturity journeys like if you start here, what's next for you? How you can progress more? How you can progress more as an individual, as a team, and for your firm or enterprise? And then uh, gamification, gamification, gamification. I believe that uh, making work fun is key. Um, uh, personally, uh, that is how I look at work. I believe lots of people are looking at it the same. And how can we bring this, this fun dimension to be always part of our work culture. Uh, that's what Agile teams are also about. That's what DevOps are about. That's why if you go in Agile spaces, you find all those board games and stuff. People want to learn best when they are playing and having fun. <laughs> Maybe turning back to when we were kids or something, but it, it's really something that I've observed. Choose your tools carefully. Consolidated testing results. Don't confuse people. So you might have tons of tooling. But consolidate the results, make them make sense so that people are just going to one place only to get the results and remediate accordingly. Uh, so tools are never the answer to every problem, but don't make them the problem. Sometimes security tooling are the problem. They are very heavy. They are very terrible. They don't integrate with anything. They can even be integrated in a pipeline. They are the problem. So choose your tools carefully. And uh, there are all, again, lots of open source options if you don't uh, have the ability to get an enterprise solution, but solutions exist out there, really. And some more. Transformations take time, so be patient, guys. Uh, encourage, enable support, in, and specifically focus on grassroots efforts, those efforts that comes out from the deaf communities. They are beautiful, and, and, and that's the roots of real change. Um, and, and, and what I really discovered also is that security teams need to uplift in the development. If we're working in AppSec, you need to be application development pros. Uh, you cannot just uh, tell them what they need to do, tell that developers to do, to do one, two, three, without really knowing how you can do it yourself, uh, which is important. Uh, there will be lots of finding, and that is fine. Work through them. Uh, and try to upper the, 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 the pain of this remediation through different events and stuff we talked about, hack days and stuff like that. Uh, avoid security champion fatigue. They are not working as your uh, enforcement head. Uh, 
you know. So don't just get them out of the of the framework, the beautiful framework they're in that's based on passion. Uh, leadership support, leadership support is key. It is really key. And uh, the more that leaders on and the and the organizations are aware of the importance of the AppSec, the more that we can really achieve lots of things together. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm super excited uh, that I, I came back here to host you today. And always don't forget, dot the eye of security. Go box, go AppSec. Thank you.